Thank you for coming, everybody, and thanks for hosting, Joe. Super excited to talk with you all about Monads and Rust and Haskell. So let's let's get into it. I'm just going to share my screen here. All right. So you should see my title slide, Monads Demystified. All good? All right. So um, let's get into this. I want to start with some anti-goals. Um, you may have heard of Monads before, and I wouldn't be surprised if the context in which you've heard about it, it came across in kind of an intimidating way. Uh, I am not trying to intimidate anybody here with what we're doing. Um, quite the opposite. I want to make this whole idea much more approachable to people. So, you know, it's okay if you don't understand it all at the first pass. It's kind of a weird concept, but uh, let's let's give it a shot. I also don't want this to become a weapon for intimidating other people, right? Um, we should find ways to use this vocabulary that we develop and share with each other in productive ways and to encourage inclusivity. And you may have also heard there's this weird joke in the Haskell programming community in, in particular about monads and some analogy to describe them using burritos. Um, feel free to forget all of that. Like it's a fun joke if you want to like go and research it. There's a lot of crazy things out there, like a paper where somebody tried to make this connection in kind of a formal way. It's, it's very bizarre, um, but no burritos here. OK, so what are our goals? I would like to be able to use the simplest language we can to express some of these concepts. And I also want to be clear that as Rust programmers, you don't need to understand monads in order to be effective. Uh, it can be a really useful way to think about your code and to find ways to structure your code, but it's not essential. So, you know, again, don't feel bad if it takes a little while to get used to these ideas. Um, if, they, if it does click and you're interested in learning more, um, or even if it doesn't, and you have the ambition to kind of figure it out, there's going to be additional resources toward the end of the talk that might be interesting to look into. I also want to introduce this generic interface that is commonly referred to as Monad. Um, in this context, a Monad in Haskell is what they call a type class. And that's very akin to what happens in Rust with traits. So this idea of an interface, you can think of Rust traits, just have that in the back of your mind if you're familiar with that. Um, Rust happens to have a few examples of types which are monadic, but it does not have a generic way to work with this higher level concept of monads. Um, at least not exactly. There, there is some interesting efforts that might push Rust more in that direction, but it's all there in Haskell already. So we'll use that to kind of frame our discussion about the higher level abstraction. And then, unfortunately, I can't provide you with burritos, but I highly encourage you to go get burritos because they're awesome. OK, so. I don't expect that anybody here is already familiar with Haskell, but um, I want to provide a, a sort of mapping between what's happening with Rust semantics and syntax and how that maps to Rust or Haskell. So here in both languages side by side, we see an add function, which takes two parameters named X and Y of some like integer-like type, right? And it returns an integer. And you can see the highlighted parts are kind of conveying what maps to each other. So x and y are the parameters. Similarly here, x and y are the parameters. And the way you 
figure out the types for these things, it's a little different than Rust, where the binding and the type are sort of side by side. Instead, what's happening is this first line with the colon colon is a type signature. And it's telling us add is a function which takes two integers and returns an integer. And you kind of map these positionally. So the first parameter has type int, the second has type int. And then the body, which comes after the equal sign, has to evaluate to an int. Okay. So an important observation here that you should keep in mind is that in Haskell, the types are capitalized. That'll be important to remember in the next slide. Okay, so now we have this idea of generics with constraints. This is also important to understand because like I said, traits from Rust are kind of a useful model for thinking about interfaces in general. And there is an analog of this in Haskell. So let's look at the Rust side first. We have this add function, which takes two types, two arbitrary types, t, and returns something of that same type. There's an additional constraint on that arbitrary type, though it can't be completely arbitrary. It has to be some type which implements the trait add and whose associated type is t for the output. So any type which implements the add trait can be used here as t. So we're effectively defining a family of functions here rather than a single concrete one like we did here. So we've effectively generalized this function by using generics. OK, now let's switch over to the Haskell side of this. Haskell has a type class called num for number. And any type which implements it happens to provide you with the plus operator. And so that's why we're using that here instead of something that's a little bit more focused, like add. But otherwise, this code, semantically, what's happening is pretty much the same. We have some generic type represented by a lowercase letter, a. And given that generic type a, we're saying we take two values of type A and we return an A. And the body of a function is exactly the same as it was before. We're just going to do x plus y. So you might see how we're generalizing the code a bit here. Um, any questions in the chat? I just want to make sure. All right, looks like we're doing all right so far. Yep, so I went over this a bit already, but again, num is a Haskell type class and it's providing a similar facility to Rust std ops add. And again, the generics are lowercase and you'll typically see Haskellers use the letter A instead of T, as we commonly do in Rust. OK, so now let's, let's consider another, op, another function here. It's a slight adaptation of what we've been doing before. Um, it's called add option. Uh, if you've done much Rust programming, you're probably somewhat familiar with option. It's a type which has a generic parameter t. And it means we either have one of those t's or we have nothing. So just kind of an idea here for what might motivate this function. Let's say 
uh, you're playing blackjack and you're like, okay, well, I have to make this decision now. Do I want to ask the dealer for another card? I have this running total for how the value of the cards I already have. And I have this choice to take another card. If I take another card, then I have some new card with a particular value. But if I don't take a card, then there's nothing to add, right? Um, so that, that kind of might line up for you, um, just as a thought model for what's happening here. So again, we have the generic parameter T with its add constraint. And we can't add an X of type T and a Y of option type T. We have to sort of unpack the T from this option if there is one. And if there's not, we have to return early and say, oh, sorry, uh, we can't actually add these because there's nothing to add to, right? So that's what this question mark is doing. Uh, this is sometimes called the try operator. Um, so we're attempting to pull out the T, the value of type T, and, and bind it to Y2 so that we can actually do the addition to the X. And then, of course, since we're returning an option T, we can't just return X plus Y2. We have to wrap that in the constructor for an option, in this case, sum as opposed to none. I just want to pause a minute. Feel free to interrupt if you are lost. So again, the question mark is helping us return early in the case that y is none. And otherwise, it's going to extract the value of type t into y2. OK, now let's look at almost the same exact code, but with res result type. Now, result, it has, it's an enum similarly with two different constructors. The only difference between it and option, though, is that it can accept some other parameter, which is commonly reserved for an error type. So you might have seen OK of some value that's interesting to you, or error, E-R-R, -R, of some particular error that needs to be returned. So you'll notice that the code is very similar to what we saw before, right? We have a y, and we want to add it to our x. But first, we need to extract the t from the y to make use of this add trait. So we use that try operator again. and if y happens to be an OK of something that's, that's a t, then we'll be able to do that extraction. Otherwise, it's going to return early. So now let's compare these side by side. They seem pretty similar, don't they? Are there any differences that jump out to anybody? Feel free to unmute. I can't really see anybody or anything. Stuff in yellow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So we have to use different constructors for the value that we're returning because in this case, we're returning an option. And in this case, we're returning a result. And you can't use a sum, for instance, for results because sum is a constructor for option. Cool. Okay, so a uh, little narrative interlude here. I have two developers, Sam and Riley. And Sam suggests, let's have that function use a monad. 
And Riley says, do you mean a result of some type and an error or option of some type? And Sam's saying, of course, they're the only types that let us use the question mark operator to sensibly return early. Um, this is my way of trying to suggest that these kind of interactions would probably generally be more productive among rust stations at least if we focus on talking about the concrete types we care about um, i think using the word monad in context like this is just more confusing than helpful and riley probably only really knows that sam is talking about result and option because they already understand the content of this talk right um, just be direct use use simple language um, but of course if you are working on the compiler team or doing interesting research on how rust could be adapted to support a more generic monadic interface then you know by all means use it uh, i just want to caution against complex language for the sake of complex language And just as a small point here, there is an unstable trait in Rust called try. And this is where we actually get the question mark operator. And it's not exactly the monadic interface that we see in Haskell in terms of what it supports, but there are many ways in which you can do similar things not all the same things. It's not as expressive. OK, so let's consider the similarities between some types in Rust and Haskell. In Rust, we have the option enum over some generic t. And again, that has two constructors, none and sum of that t. So if I have an option I32, I could construct one of those by saying none or sum of, say, five. Similarly, in Haskell, there's a type called maybe. And it also takes one generic parameter A. And it could either be nothing or just of A. So you could construct a maybe in a Haskell by saying nothing, or uh, if you're making a maybe int, you could say just five. They're essentially the same idea. OK, so let's consider how we would port the add maybe function that we saw earlier in Rust over to Haskell. So again, our x is going to be of type int. The y is a maybe int. And our goal is to return a maybe int. So here you'll see we have this new do syntax right after the equal sign. This is the first time we're seeing some Haskell code where the body of the function is line by line. And here, we get this special new syntax provided by this do context that's a left arrow. And it's doing essentially the same thing that Haskell's question mark was doing. It's saying, all right, well, we have this y, which is a maybe int. We want to extract the int out of it if there is one. In other words, if we happen to have a just of some int as opposed to a nothing. On the other hand, if it happens to be nothing, we want to return early with nothing, just like the question mark operator does. So here, y2, if we successfully bind to it, is going to be an int. And then we can use the plus 
operator on x and y2 to construct an int. And then because we have to return a maybe int, we need to wrap all of that in just uh, one of the two maybe constructors. So these are a couple example expressions demonstrating what's happening. If we do add maybe two and nothing, again, the nothing is going to cause it to short circuit on this left arrow and it'll return nothing. If we do add maybe two to just three, then instead y2 is going to be set to three and then we'll do x plus y2 or two plus three and we'll get just five. Okay, so now let's compare Rust's result to the analog of that type in Haskell called either. So in Rust, there are two generic parameters, t and e. Conventionally, the t is for some type that uh, represents the computation that you're trying to execute. And then e corresponds to some error type that you might encounter along the way in computing that t. Um, and you'll notice here that I highlighted the b, the second generic parameter, on either the same way I highlighted the t. So the convention in Haskell is swapped. Uh, we don't have to get into the reasons why now, um, but if you follow that later on, it might become clearer. So left and error, these two constructors kind of correspond to each other. They're dedicated to the error case. And then right and OK, these constructors kind of line up with each other. So again, just like with Rust option and Haskell's maybe, the syntax is similar, but more importantly, the semantics are essentially the same. Here, we have another pair of semantically lined up types in these two languages. And we can use that to kind of understand more about one language in terms of the other. OK, so let's see what the add either function would look like in Haskell. It's essentially the same as what we saw before with add maybe, except here we have add either, we have either error int for both the second parameter and the return type instead of just maybe int for both. So our y could either be something like left of my error, in which case we short circuit on this left-hand arrow and return left my er error right away, or we successfully extract the int that we're interested in and we're able to continue on with the y2 binding and construct our right five. Everyone following? Just going to check the chat really quick, too. OK. So let's just briefly compare the add maybe and add either functions in Haskell. Notice that, like when we looked at the add maybe and add either in Rust, the bodies are almost exactly the same. However, the constructors that we're using are different. That and the type signature are the only differences. 
So it might be interesting to ask, can we factor out the parts that are the same and make this code even more generic? Turns out we can. So let's try using this idea called pure. Pure is something that it's a function that's available for all monads in Haskell. And anytime we say that a type is monadic, it's monadic with respect to some other type. So you'll see I have this blank here for the generic parameter that is unspecified. What we're saying is maybe is a monad, but the type over which we're mon monadic isn't specified until we're in a specific context working with, in this case, an int, right? But pure doesn't even need to know that type until the last minute. Um, if we say pure and we're working in a maybe context, pure essentially becomes an alias for just a case where we have something of this type that here happens to be int, which we're trying to lift into the monadic context. I know that's a lot to digest, but um, if we compare against what was happening here, all that's changing is we had just for add maybe, and now we're using pure. That's the only change. And if you look at how the maybe monad is defined in Haskell's base library, you'll see that there's a line that says pure equals just. It's just an alias. But it's an alias that's useful to more than just maybe that function pure can be used with any monad. And its behavior depends on how monad is defined for the particular type you're dealing with. So again, here's examples of how this app maybe works. It's exactly the same as before. Um, so in the nothing case, we're going to short circuit and return nothing earlier. If we have a just of three, we're able to extract the three, add it to the two. And when we do pure of two plus five, pure goes and says, all right, we're in a maybe context. Let's go look up how pure is defined for maybe. And it finds that it's the same as just. So that's how we get the just five. OK, and then we can do the exact same refactoring with add either. So instead of write for the constructor at the end, we just use pure. And in an either monadic context for some particular error, what happens is pure becomes an alias for right. So that's why this all works out. I'm just going to take a second to check the chat. Yep. Um, yeah, thank you, Dan S, for responding to Mark's question. Or sorry, uh, to uh, <laughs> other way around, Mark for responding to Dan S's question. Maybe is one of the monads in Haskell. Um, and either, along with some particular error type, is also a monad. And that's why we get to use pure here as well. 
So the approach I'm taking with this talk, it's, it it's probably feels a bit weird. I'm not starting from first principles explaining what a monad is from the ground up. I'm trying to more immerse you into the similarities between constructs that are in Rust that happen to be monadic in Haskell and get you used to those connections so that you can use that as a foundation to build on if you really want to understand some of the more fundamental details that Honestly, if I got into them, it would start to feel more like a math lecture. So again, here we see that the behavior of our add either function after this refactoring is preserved. Okay, so um, now what, what differences do we have between add either and add maybe at this point? We got rid of at least one of them by using pure. Anyone notice anything else? I the only difference I see is the monad. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite catch that. The only, the only difference now I see between these is literally the, uh, the type of monad. Exactly. Yep. So that's kind of interesting, right? The code is exactly the same. It's just the function signature that's slightly different. And it turns out we can also factor out the difference there as well. And that's where things get really kind of interesting. So let's explore that. OK, so. Suppose we want to generalize over all monads in Rust or Haskell. This would be the equivalent in Rust if we could do something like T over some particular I32, where T is a generic. So for instance, maybe T could be a vec, an option, a result of T and error, any number of things you could imagine where there's a type that accepts one additional generic parameter where we could slot in the i32 and the kind of like outer type, in this case, back option result, that would be our T. That's kind of what we're trying to do here in Haskell. So this add monad function, we're saying, all right, for any monad M, we have an int and we have a monadic int and we want to return a monadic int where that monad is the same type as the second parameter's monad. Right? So these m's have to be preserved throughout the whole function. So the code looks exactly like it did before. It's just the signature has changed and become more generic now. And interestingly, this code is so generic even that it could work with monads that are defined in the future. It, it works for all monads out of the box that exist now and those that could exist in the future. So here, let's see how it would work with our maybe and our either. It's the same thing, really, as what we had before. This last example, though, this is new. We're getting this for free just by doing this refactoring. So in Haskell, there's this idea of a list. A list is something which can either be empty or it can be a pair of something of type T along with another list of type T. Um, if you've done any Lisp programming, this is kind of similar to what's going on with like com cells and stuff. It's really, it's, it's a singly typed list. That's what's happening. A singly linked list. And syntactically, we represent an empty list 
with these brackets with nothing inside them. And here we have a, a list that starts with two, then three, then four. Now, the way we interpret what's happening in a monadic context here, it's really kind of cool. List in a monadic context is used to model non-deterministic computation. So in the case of an empty list, we're saying there's no computations we care about executing. So when we get to this line here with the left arrow, return early in the case of the empty list. There's nothing else to do here. However, if you have things in the list, what happens is this code is effectively executed as many times as there are elements in the list. So two is going to be added to the first element of the list, and we get a four. And then similarly with each of the additional elements. And you might look at this and say, oh, this is kind of like a map, if you're familiar with mapping over items and applying the same function. But it's, it's a little bit more powerful than that if you generalize this even. Because if you instead had another monadic int here for the first parameter, and you wanted to model the addition of lists of ints, what would happen with this code if we had like an x to left arrow x is it would take all pairs of elements, one from the first list, one from the second list, and give you the list, which is kind of a Cartesian product of all of those combinations, right? It's, it's really modeling non-deterministic computation more so than a map. So it's a pretty powerful idea. And just by doing a small refactoring, we got that power for free. So now I want to share with you a bit more examples of common useful monads in Haskell that we also get for free by doing that kind of a refactoring. So I already showed you these first three. We have maybe either and the linked list. Let's suppose also that you have a parser. Um, so you might imagine you have a stream of bytes or a stream of characters that you're trying to process and interpret as some type A. Well, we all know that a parser could fail. Uh, Sometimes you have invalid input and you have to abort and say, sorry, that's not a valid input. But if it happens to be valid, then you can get an A out of it for some particular A. So you might imagine a parser for an int. Well, maybe that's implemented by saying, give me a parser for a digit and repeated, repeatedly apply that. So these, these constructs can kind of compose in really useful ways. You can also have this idea of a pseudo random value generator where there's internal state in the generator that needs to be tracked as you're generating random values. Um, so a sort of deterministic random number generator, for instance. Um, I see there's a question from Jack here. Why does parser want to be its own separate monad rather than using either parse error or something like that to represent parse, parsing failures? Uh, that's a good question. You could actually use either if you wanted to implement a parser. Um, but there's also kind of domain specific kinds of functions that you might imagine wanting when you're working with parsers. And so that's sort of the motivation behind all of this. 
Um, in practice, parser is generally defined in um, contributed libraries as opposed to the base library in Haskell. So it's kind of a matter of taste as well, like what kinds of abstractions do you want to build up versus you know, reusing from really small basic uh, basic building blocks. Um, another useful one is called arbitrary A. There's this idea of property-based tests where you can describe a property which should hold over all of your inputs to a given test. So with a unit test, you generally have specific inputs that you're working with and you're saying something about them. A property-based test, you're kind of generalizing that idea and you're saying, okay, well, I don't necessarily need to know the exact inputs, but I do know that the relationship between the inputs and outputs must exhibit some particular property, right? Like maybe the output is always greater than some input. So you could write a property-based test, which exemplifies that constraint. And as long as you have an arbitrary A implementation, where A is some particular type that you care about for your inputs to that test, then a property-based testing engine can actually generate tests for you on the fly and look for counterexamples of that property. So it's a really, really powerful idea. Um, and again, you can kind of get this for free by working with monads. There's also this idea of modeling external input and output that happens to be monadic. So Haskell had this challenge early on in trying to figure out how to model external IO. You might have heard that Haskell is a pure language. And everything that's happening in Haskell is based on these very precise mathematically defined operations. That's really useful. And it turns out it's also hard to get that kind of a pure model of things to work with the impure mutation that happens when you're interacting with external systems that you don't control. You can't properly model the non-determinism of the whole universe around you and all the kinds of ways that could affect the inputs and outputs to your program. So this is in a way what motivated the development of monads and its application to Haskell. Um, they discovered that, well, you can take this idea of a monad and use it to describe the kind of computation that you want to have happen in a pure way, but defer the impure interactions to the runtime. And there's a lot more that could be said on that, but that's, that's kind of the idea at least. You can also use monads to model stateful computation and even use an implementation of software transactional memory, which is super useful for modeling concurrency. Um, interestingly, Haskell is one of the first languages to be able to implement software transactional memory. And it was relatively straightforward to do once people had formalized the concept. Whereas in many other languages, it turned out to be super, super hard to implement. OK. So I want to get into what's happening with that do syntax that we saw earlier in Haskell. Because it turns out it's a syntactic sugar. But first, I need to explain what's happening with lambda functions. So in Rust, you might be familiar with this idea of a closure, where 
we take some parameter and we do a computation with it. So in this case, we're saying, I have some input y, and I want to be able to add it to 2. And we bind that to this uh, variable add2. And then we can use it as though it's a function. And we pass in a 3, and this would evaluate to 5. Uh, this is the corresponding syntax in Haskell. So we start with a backslash and then our parameter. And after the right arrow, that's describing what computation we're doing. And after the in, we can start using add to as though it's a function. So again, if we do add two and pass in three, that's going to give us five. And you can see we don't even necessarily need the add to identifier to take advantage of this idea. Um, in Rust, you could just put that whole expression in parentheses and then pass the arguments in parentheses after, and this will evalu evaluate to five. And similarly, you can do this kind of thing in Haskell too. Okay, so now here's the magic where we see how do gets desugared. There's this binary operator that all monads have in Haskell that looks like a greater than greater than equals. And it's commonly pronounced bind. And what's happening here is we're saying, all right, we have a monadic int y. And rather than the left arrow, which was unpacking the int from the monadic context, if there was one, what we're saying here is we have some y, which is a monadic int, and we're going to attempt to unpack it, kind of evaluating to the right instead. Um, and if we successfully unpack it, it's going to become an input to this uh, expression that accepts y2. So like before, we had y2 left arrow y, but now it's y greater than greater than equals, and then passed into some function, which takes the parameter y2. It's doing the same thing there, right? And then this last part after the right arrow, that was the second line of our do. That's the thing that we return after we extract the int into our y2 or potentially return early in the process of attempting to extract the int. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So there are certain mathematical properties that have to be upheld with monads and the behavior of this bind operator. Um, I'm not going to spell them out, but I want you to be aware that there are some that you need to be aware of if you're going to be implementing your own monads. If you follow these conventional laws, then it's going to make it so that users of your monad are going to understand better what's happening. Um, they're going to be less surprised when they actually go to use your, your monadic type. And it's also important to understand that it is on the implementer to verify that their monad implementation is consistent with those monadic laws. The compiler will not verify it for you. So it's important to be aware of. And then if you want to actually implement your own monad, there's a few type classes that you need to understand because monad depends on those being implemented. So there's this idea of a functor, an applicative, and a monad. I won't get into all of that, but I, I do want to show you very briefly 
there is a way that you can look these things up. So if you install the Haskler, Haskell compiler GHC, you'll get this GHC I interpreter. And you can do doc functor and get all this useful documentation about what's happening. And I'll just show you monad since that's what we're really after. So you'll see examples of bind being used here. And actually, it spells out the exact laws that you need to care about. And then these are some useful resources that I recommend looking into both on the Haskell side and the Rust side, if you're interested in these ideas. Um, I realize you can't click on the links now, but I will make sure that we get these slides posted to the Meetup page so you have access to them. Okay, and that's it. Thanks, everyone.